Hello, my name is Julian Savalescu. I'm the UHERO Chair of Practical Ethics. Welcome to tonight's debate on vaccination. Um, I am also the Director of the Oxford Martin School Program on Collective Responsibility for Infectious Disease. It's, I'm uh, unfortunately also hosting this, um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Samantha Vanderslot, who is an Oxford Martin Fellow on the Program for Collective Responsibility for Infectious Disease and also with the Oxford Vaccine Research Group. So we will have 10 minutes strictly for each of us, then a little bit of dialogue and then Q&A. The Q&A will only be available through the Ask the Question function at the bottom right hand uh, of your screen. So please type in your questions into that. Um, so without any further ado, I will move to um, do a 10 minute presentation on the arguments in favour of mandatory vaccination. Uh, so let me just get this up. Uh, so, so I'm going to start with the, 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 the two assumptions that make the debate interesting. And that is that, um, first of all, there's, a, there's enough vaccine um, to go around for everyone who would benefit. And secondly, that, that mandatory vaccination is going to have uh, an advantage over alternative policies such as voluntary vaccination. There's no really interesting debate if there's not enough vaccination uh, vaccines or if in fact uh, voluntary vaccination is, is the fastest way to get to herd immunity. The interesting issue comes when, when mandatory vaccination is going to offer us some benefits but uh, costs people's liberty. So it's a general ethical principle that the state can only use coercion to prevent a threat of one person harming another. So for example, if a child goes to school with a bottle of toxic bleach or a gun, that uh, bleach or gun can be removed from the child because the child might harm others. And infectious disease is a case of microscopic, potentially lethal threats. So one individual can be asymptomatic and potentially kill others. And it's in restricting this threat that coercion is justified in lockdown, quarantine, and also mandatory vaccination. And another aspect to the argument for mandatory vaccination is that in a pandemic, time is lives. Um, every day around the world, 5,000 people die uh, of COVID-19. Every day we delay getting to herd immunity, uh, another 5,000 people around the world die. So it's not just a matter of getting to herd immunity, uh, it's a matter of getting there as quickly as possible. Now estimates put that um, somewhere between 50 to 80% of the population needs to immunize, be immunized to create herd immunity. But there's considerable evidence that in, in the case of COVID-19, there will be greater than usual vaccine hesitancy. In the most recent poll in the United States uh, indicates that up to half of the population won't take a vaccine. And similarly, research from King's uh, College London uh, shows that only about half of the UK population is very likely or certain to take the new vaccine. Uh, so that will mean that it takes longer to get to herd immunity. It's important to, to recognise that mandatory vaccination would not be anything new. There are many mandatory policies, other coercive policies. Taxes are a form of uh, coercion. Seatbelts were originally um, voluntary and they were made mandatory because they both reduced the risk of death to the wearer by 50% and, and also to other occupants in the car. But importantly, some people do die of seatbelt injuries. But the, but the benefits vastly outweigh the risks. Some countries in the world already have mandatory vaccination policies. In Australia, the no jab, no pay policy involves withholding childcare benefits if, um, if the child isn't vaccinated. In Italy, there are fines. And in the US, uh, children can't attend school unless they're vaccinated. All of these policies have increased vaccination rates and have been implementable. It's important to recognise that mandatory vaccination does not necessarily mean holding somebody down and forcibly vaccinating them. It means attaching some cost to not being vaccinated. For example, 
Uh, in Italy, I think the fines are 500 euros. In, in the US, you have to homeschool your child. Um, so the, if, the, if the costs are reasonable, mandatory vaccination can be acceptable to people. It's not just um, that the, there are benefits to the individual and others. There are four factors which need to be considered in deciding whether a vaccination should be mandatory. First of all, how grave is the problem? How serious? Secondly, what's the level of confidence that the vaccine is safe and effective? Thirdly, it has to be better than alternative strategies, including voluntary or incentivized vaccination. And lastly, the costs have to be proportionate to the gravity of the problem and the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So I'll talk a little about, about each of those four factors. How bad is COVID-19? Well, there've been a million deaths worldwide and over 50,000 deaths in the UK. It's not just COVID-19 that is uh, killing people, it's the lockdown that the government requires in the absence of vaccination. One leaked report puts 200,000 non-COVID lives uh, uh, will be lost as a result of lockdown, not to mention the 250 billion euros that the uh, measures have so far clocked up. The infection fatality rate is still not clear. Uh, it ranges from somewhere between 0.03% to 03 or 0.4%. Uh, and that many people judge to be a significantly high infection fatality rate. There are, of course, arguments that COVID-19 is not grave enough to warrant mandatory vaccination. So even in Sweden, which has not had mandatory lockdown, um, the highest all-cause death rate in Sweden during the pandemic was similar or actually surpassed in years, in months in 1993 and 2000. The number of excess deaths in the UK is still at the level of 2008. Um, so I think it's debatable whether COVID-19 is severe enough, but what is fairly clear is the lockdown, which appears to be necessary from the government's point of view, is imposing grave costs and vaccination has been said to be by, by Boris Johnson to be the only way out of it. How safe is the vaccine? Well, again, um, trials are not yet complete, um, but there are reasons to question whether the COVID-19 vaccine will be um, safe enough to be made mandatory. First of all, um, this, a decade of work has been compressed into a year. There's never been a vaccine against the coronavirus, both the mRNA and adenovirus vaccines and new vaccines, and any um, new biological intervention carries unforeseen risks. No vaccine can be said to be 100% safe, uh, and it will take uh, months or years to see rare side effects emerge and, and many hundreds of thousands of people uh, administered the vaccine. So there will be some uncertainty. It's also important to compare mandatory vaccination to all the other relevant alternatives for controlling the infection, um, and they include both voluntary vaccination and incentivized vaccination. But for the purposes of argument, I'm going to assume that mandatory vaccination confers benefits. Um, and lastly, the costs need to be proportionate to the gravity of the problem and the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So modest fines or withholding of certain benefits may be proportionate, but it's unlikely that imprisonment or, or compulsory vaccination would be justified. And it's important to compare the loss of freedom that a mandatory vaccination would involve with the loss of freedom we've all already experienced through lockdown and quarantine. Um, one of the arguments that is often given is that we should choose the least restrictive alternative. Um, but that's a very weak principle. Um, it means the two alternatives are equally likely to bring about um, the same beneficial effect. The, the issue is when we can in, in, infringe freedom more for greater benefit, and here proportionality is the key. And if mandatory vaccination is an easy rescue, that is the cost is small relative to the collective benefit, it can be ethically justified. So there are three reasons to think that mandatory vaccination for COVID-19 might be justified. First of all, we need to get to herd immunity fast both to protect people and to get out of lockdown. We need to protect the vulnerable 
Some people can't be vaccinated for medical reasons. They have allergies or immune problems or other illnesses, and they require herd immunity. They require others to be vaccinated in order for them to be protected. In many diseases such as influenza, influenza the elderly don't mount a strong immune response. So um, influenza like COVID-19 is a primarily uh, a disease of the elderly and um, or lethal in the case of the elderly. And the best way to protect the elderly against influenza is not to vaccinate them, not to vaccinate healthcare workers, but to vaccinate children because they are the super spreaders in influenza and they mount good immune responses. Whether COVID-19 is like influenza remains to be seen. It appears the vaccines are effective in elderly people and it appears that children are not super spreaders. Um, but under certain conditions, it may be that a, a vaccination of the whole population is necessary to achieve sufficient herd immunity. Immunity also wanes over time and that makes uh, it necessary to make, have much higher levels of vaccination. So mandatory vaccination in conclusion can certainly be ethically justified on the basis of preventing harm to others um, if it reduces transmission of infection. It can also be justified to protect the NHS from enormous pressure of people becoming sick. Uh, and it's most justified um, when uh, herd immunity is required to, to bring the country out of lockdown and, and protect the population. Thank you. I'll now pass over, uh, if we can end the presentation, Clara to my colleague, Samantha, to give the arguments against mandatory vaccination in COVID-19. Thank you very much, Jason. So I'm gonna switch over to my screen. Oh, that was not. Okay, so I'm going to be making the argument um, against mandatory vaccination. And of course, this is quite a binary way of thinking about the problem of how to raise vaccine uptake. Uh, but the question of whether to introduce mandatory vaccination doesn't seem to go away. Uh, there's some huge appeal in media and as a debate topic. And it's actually something that politicians like to talk about, and I'll go into that. In presenting this case then about um, uh, mandatory vaccination and why I don't think it's a good idea. I'm going to highlight the historical context, uh, how this is fed into public and policy responses, uh, what the impact of recent outbreaks has been worldwide, and now the prospects for COVID-19 vaccination. So starting off, uh, what have the politicians been saying? So Matt Hancock, the UK Health Secretary last year already said, I'm seriously looking at it. Uh, at the moment, he said he's not ruling it out. Scott Morrison, who is the Australian Prime Minister, said, I would expect it to be mandatory as, as you can possibly make. Uh, he said this in the morning. By the afternoon, he actually said, we can't hold someone down and, make, and take it. And that was really um, in response to the, the backlash that he received when saying that it should be mandatory. And then finally, Jean Dora. Uh, who's Sao Paulo governor, said in Sao Paulo it will, be, will be mandatory except for those with a medical note and a certificate saying that they cannot. And um, this put him in opposition to uh, the president, Bolsonaro, and um, uh, he also was, was told that he doesn't have the authority to make this decision. Um, sorry, Bolsonaro. And so what can we make of this? I think politicians, they tend to like the idea of mandatory vaccination. Uh, it shows them taking a strong line. Uh, it's also very appealing because it appears to solve a problem um, of low vaccination uh, quite easily without having to um, put in too much cost and resources and you get a high impact. So what we also know from historical examples is that this is not always the case. So. Uh, particularly with compulsory vaccination very early on for smallpox uh, in, in countries. Uh, this is also a good time to make some distinctions between compulsory and uh, mandatory vaccination. So um, Julian did uh, hint at this, but um, uh, there's a scale of co co coerciveness that we're talking about. So mandatory and compulsory, they're, they're used interchangeably, but compulsory tends to be attached to legal efforts. 
Uh, you can see it with this um, picture of the policeman in this Victorian image in England. So um, the law is enforcing vaccination and you would be criminalised or face um, punishment. And mandatory vaccination um, refers to all sorts of requirements and that might be financial incentives and disincentives, access to public goods like education, um, and this early compulsory vaccination, though, was very co co coercive and it provoked organised mass resistance movements um, in many countries, including England and the Netherlands. And places like England reverted back to making vaccination voluntary and only recommending vaccination. But people still need to be encouraged to vaccinate um, and they're not going to do it without a prompt. So what did um, England do? Uh, so the WHO working group um, actually put this quite concisely uh, with what they call the three C's. And these are factors that influence vaccination, um, which includes complacency, convenience and confidence. So with complacency, this is the feeling of um, being safe and not at risk, um, perhaps because vaccination has meant that diseases aren't seen uh, at the moment. Convenience is about how easy and feasible it is to be vaccinated. Uh, then we've got confidence, which is trust in vaccine safety and the people behind vaccination. So here in the UK, uh, with the NHS and campaigns to tackle the, these three C's um, through services and policy and ed education and persuasion, um, other countries also followed a similar suit. And this has led to quite high uptake rates in vaccination. What I think is really crucial here is balancing um, between these two groups in society. So um, it's designing policies that take into account these two groups, uh, what you might call the passive compliers and the active resistors. And um, it's simplifying it slightly, but um, these are delivered through institutions. So you're catering for two sections of um, society. And having policies that are coercive enough to encourage but not coercive enough to provoke resistance, which is what we see with mandatory vaccination policy. Um, so it's really not overshooting or undershooting, there's a balance. And I think mandatory vaccination is too provocative to a group that we know um, will resist um, and can grow larger because of that provocation. Uh, and you have people who uh, move in between being the more passive compliers and more active resistors and they can be influenced, you might call them the hesitant group. And that can grow um, in reaction to these kind of policies. Okay, so uh, this is fine, but th then what do we do if the policies don't work well enough? And we've seen that with um, uh, vaccine preventable disease outbreaks recently uh, with measles. Uh, the US, in response to outbreaks, um, has mandatory vaccination for school entry already. And then they removed uh, non-medical exemptions in certain states, including California, in 2016. Um, Italy has mandatory vaccination and um, these rules were strengthened. France also has had mandatory vaccination for one vaccine, um, but they also included recommended vaccines um, in previous years. Uh, Samoa had a big measles outbreak and they made vaccination mandatory during a state of emergency. And then lastly, Germany made measles mandatory for school um, attendance and daycare for measles vaccination. Then you will ask, will these policies work? And yes, you do see an upward trend. Um, and later figures for 2020, you do see vaccination rates going up. Um, but I want to make two points to counter why um, there is more behind uh, vaccine uptake than um, this uptick than might um, seem apparent. So with, um, with the first point, I think it's hard to separate the impact of other policies. Um, there are ways around mandatory vaccination policy that might be hidden in the data. And I won't go into detail about this, but you can see this in America where two earlier policies were seen to have an impact that um, uh, led to higher uptake and um, possibly were already making a difference before uh, the exemptions to vaccination that weren't medical um, had been passed through a Senate bill. And on my second point, I think which is also crucial is that mandatory vaccination doesn't 
um, address the underlying causes of vaccine hesitancy and refusal. And it could result in a backlash, as I've gone into, and lead to other unintended consequences like um, inequity in education, so if you can't go to school. And um, we have to also look at other countries that managed to achieve a high uptake uh, without having mandatory vaccination, like Sweden. And I think if you look at mandatory vaccination worldwide, there's such a mixed picture and it doesn't really respond to having a high uptake in vaccination. All right, so is this, is this the end of the story? Um, I think the only concession that I would give is that um, uh, a degree of mandatoryness uh, could be possible without having a blanket policy. And I think this could apply to particular sections of the economy or the society on a more conditional basis. And uh, for travel, we've seen this in a recent announcement by um, the Qantas boss um, saying that COVID-19 vaccines will be mandatory for passengers. And you can think of other situations where you might put this into place. Um, and we have examples from flu in healthcare workers being um, uh, asked to vaccinate and also having a yellow fever vaccine passport to go in and out of countries that have a high risk of yellow fever transmission. And at the same time, I think it's, we need to think about the other policies. So in, increasing what I've mentioned are the three C's and involving the public along in this process. Um, but then we have to also ask, will these more coercive policies be actually necessary? And I think there are indications that um, the UK um, does have support for COVID-19 vaccines. So um, we're not doing as badly as other countries. 75% um, um, uh, uh, were saying that they would um, totally agree with a uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, that has fallen a bit and is a cause for concern. Um, but you can see in the protest, this picture of the protest against um, lockdown rules, there are already protests about no to uh, mandatory vaccines. And I think this is raising a red flag to the ball by um, introducing a policy like this, when you know that um, there is an opposition out there already. And to end, I want to uh, end with uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, to point out that also this isn't a situation of mandatory vaccination or nothing. Uh, I think what needs to be happening is a concerted campaign with engagement with the public and communication about COVID-19 vaccines. And um, this includes answering questions and concerns that people might have about new vaccines, um, and not necessarily needing to be coercive about this. So um, I definitely don't think it will be as straightforward as this description um, as uh, Boris Johnson has given, but um, yeah, I would recommend um, not focusing on mandatory when we're in this delicate situation of communicating with new vaccines. So I'll conclude there. Thanks very much, uh, Sam. That's fantastic. I think um, the, the program says that we will we'll, uh, ask each other uh, some questions, um, uh, you know, just uh, for a few minutes before we have a general discussion. Um, so let me just ask you, one of the major kind of arguments against mandatory vaccination is that we'll increase uh, resistance to vaccination um, but as far as I know, you know, there is a group of the population somewhere around 5% who are clearly resistant to vaccination now and, and will be resistant to it under a mandatory policy. Um, but those swing voters um, that you describe, as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence from countries that have introduced mandatory policies that those people have gone over to the anti-vaccination movement. Um, or are you aware of any empirical evidence that, that people will move uh, to an anti-vaccination stance if it's made new, you know, people who are currently supportive will move over? Yeah, so you're right about the lack of evidence because I think the examples that I provided with um, the new mandatory vaccination requirements in especially in Europe, um, it's going to take some time before we see the impact of those. Um, if, yeah, especially if you're thinking about um, 
uh, the countries where it's more across the board, not just one vaccination and not say the US where we're talking about particular states tightening up uh, vaccine requirements. So um, for policies that have happened in the last one or two, three years, um, I think we are seeing an uptick in um, the resistance against vaccination uh, because of those policies, but it isn't. It hasn't been in an extreme way, um, but that might happen over time. I think that's the worry. We've seen a growing increase. Okay. Are there things you wanted to ask me, or should I ask you another question? Um, yeah. So I, it's kind of, it's connected to this. Um, I'm worried about the harmful effects, and your least restrictive alternative doesn't seem to take into account um, what might be the harmful effects of um, this policy intervention. It's only considering the benefits. That, that was my impression of it. Or would you have a different way of... No, no, you're completely right. You need to consider the harmful effects, the flow-on effects to other vaccines, um, the Im impact on vaccine hesitancy. So, yes, you're completely correct. When you're comparing two policies, you've got to You've got to compare all the effects, not just one of them. At the moment, we see, you know, the government is focused purely on COVID deaths, not all deaths, including cancer deaths. And, and that's an example of, of sort of myopic focus. So I, I agree with you that we, we do need to, to consider all of those effects. Um, what would you say to, to a trial um, of uh, different policies in, in different um, cities? So, you know, maybe you would do you know, mandatory vaccination in, in Liverpool and voluntary vaccination in Manchester and, and paid vaccination in Leeds, you know, positively pay people to be vaccinated and then see which has the, the most rapid uptake and the, and, the, and the best effect. What do you think about a trial of, of these different policies? Um, uh, I, I suppose there's already controversy about the, the different tiers, um, so that would be an issue. Um, I would worry also about trialing something like this um, and your point about herd immunity. Um, if, you, if, if you think that the vaccines are going to contribute to herd immunity and that's a slight issue because we don't really know whether, it, whether they're going to stop transmission. Um, only the Oxford vaccine has hinted at that. So uh, I think that undermines the argument of having uh, mandatory vaccination to promote herd immunity. Uh, and doing a te doing an experiment on that scale, uh, I, I would also be a bit worried about uh, in terms of the public reaction. Yeah. Um, well, there's another question you want to ask me, or shall I ask you another one? Uh, you go next, and then I'll. I'll All right. So, I, I for, for for that before everyone attacks me personally, I don't personally think there should be a mandatory policy. I'm just giving you the arguments. Um, and, and I think actually the strongest argument against uh, mandatory vaccination is not one that you've given. Um, and that's one that if the vaccine's effective, you, mm -hmm. you can protect yourself by getting vaccinated. Um, you don't need um, to have herd immunity. So to take the Qantas sort of concern, if your concern is about, you know, protecting the other passengers and the, and the crew on the Qantas flights, they can get vaccinated. Um, it doesn't require me to get vaccinated to protect them if the vaccine's effective. Um, now, the response to that is, I think, well, some people just won't be able to get vaccinated. Um, they have immune problems, they have allergies, et cetera, or the vaccine doesn't work in them, whatever. So, you know, we need to protect those people. I mean, how do you deal with that objection to uh, that we need to protect the people who can't be vaccinated? I, I do agree with that point because I think her perspective is often not put across. Uh, and you do see people on the, the pro-vaccine side or people who are supporting vaccines uh, actually making this argument more that there are people that can't be vaccinated and who's thinking about their, their rights for health and what responsibility we have for them, especially immunocompromised people and um, uh, with these new vaccines, particular groups might not be tested. Um, and yeah, this is I, I agree with you on this. I think this is a worry. Okay, well, maybe I'll ask you one more question, which I'm interested in. So Samantha works with Andy Pollard, the sort of one of the, the trio of, of gurus behind the Oxford vaccine. And, and, and aren't 
Isn't your group worried about the sort of public perception around safety? You know, I've, I've heard a lot of ordinary people, you know, my daughter, for example, university students say, look, this is a new vaccine. You know, we, 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 we're going to wait to see, you know, how safe it is. So not these aren't anti-vaxxers. These are people with genuine concerns about safety through such a rapid process. Uh, uh, is Andy and, and the group worried about that? Because that, that's different to measles. Measles has been around for, you know, decades. Um, this is, you know, a, a new kind of vaccine for a new disease that we don't really understand yet. Um, are, are they worried about people being reluctant to get vaccinated in this particular circumstance? I think we know that safety is the, the, the key concern for people. And um, that's that's normally the main reason why people are um, opposed to vaccination, are concerns about safety. And um, we know that this will be heightened with new vaccines. We've seen this in other instances. Um, I, I wouldn't speak to uh, what, what the rest of the, the group are thinking about um, uh, safety of vaccines, but I'm sure this is something that they're that's top of their priority list, um, as you would as you would have that in developing vaccines. Sorry, let me ask you one last <laughs> question. So, what what's what happened with HPV? That vaccine was rolled out when my daughters were at school, and then I think a child had a fit. Children have fits all the time, and then this was um, said. You know, the the vaccine was implicated. Eventually, you know, it was thought that the vaccine wasn't um, the cause of the fit. But given that you're going to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine to the whole population, um, people die all the time and, and, and people will predictably die after they get the COVID-19 vaccine. And it may be very difficult to unravel whether the death was would have occurred anyway or was related to the vaccine. I mean, how, how do you think that the public can be reassured in those cases when there will be predictably, you know, illnesses and, and, and deaths and, and fitting and, and that normally occurs in, at a population level when the vaccine is, is being administered to everyone. Isn't, isn't that a, a kind of cause for increased vaccine hesitancy and concern? Yeah, so I, I think it's how the government would respond to um, any reports of uh, adverse effects happening. And um, the normal course of action would be to investigate, and if if there were um, if there was cause to put a pause on um, a vaccine campaign, that would happen. Um, in some examples, you see, um, say, Japan responding to reports of adverse events with a HPV vaccine, um, completely stopping that vaccine in the country um, without confirming any connection with uh, the vaccine and adverse events. So. Uh, you could see that was maybe not the right kind of response because it gives the impression of there being a problem with the vaccine, even though that's not confirmed. And it gets reported also as a ban and um, that message goes across to other countries. So um, I, I would be more worried about overreaction to uh, adverse events happening that might not be connected to the vaccine at all. Okay, so we should go to the questions. Um... So I'll just go down in the, the order that I saw. Actually, there's votes next to them, so I'll take the one with the most votes on it. So there's, there's one that's got 11 votes from Daniel, who asks, what do you think can be done to provide people with the right facts about vaccines and stem disinformation from them? That seems like one for you, Sam. Um, so to provide people with the vaccines and stem disinformation? Yeah, right, yeah, so the right facts about vaccines and STEM disinformation about them. Yeah, so we're, we're seeing a lot of the disinformation and misinformation online, on social media, and this is where you you expect our um, government and health authorities to be being proactive and going into those spaces and making sure that they're, they're getting across um, positive messages about vaccines and, and showing what the benefits are, but also addressing questions and concerns uh, about safety and answering the questions that people have, you know, uh, about being worried about new vaccines. So uh, I think that this can't be dismissed um, and I think it would be easy to to lump um, queries that people might have into being um, misinformed or um, ignorance but they they need to be getting out public health messages about vaccines how how they're um, safe um, 
and addressing people's concerns. Okay, so um, Peter Archdale uh, asks, how do we reconcile the rights of one individual to refuse a vaccine against the rights of individuals in society who expect to be protected by others taking um, protective measures, including vaccination? And, and I think that's a good question. Um, and I, I think it, I'll give a, a brief answer. Um, it depends on on the the level of risk that that individual be, will be exposing other people to. Um, so, you know, in the extreme example of somebody carrying a gun, we can take the gun off them. But obviously, that gun analogy doesn't work when there's a one in ten thousand chance that you will kill somebody by not being vaccinated. So, in part, the the answer depends. Uh, on on how effective the vaccine is at protecting other people uh, and how close we are to herd immunity. Um, paradoxically, the less effective a vaccine is, the less we can do to just protect ourselves and the more we require other people around us to, to be vaccinating. So it will be a question that will, will depend on the, the nature of the vaccine, the, the, the nature of the people affected and, and by how many other people are already taking it. Sam, do you have anything to say about that question? Yeah. Do you think this, how would you put this in the context of COVID-19 vaccines and the risk to certain individuals? Look, I mean, my own personal view is that, um, it, you know, we shouldn't be requiring young people to take vaccines because they're at an extremely low risk. The chance of a 10 year old dying of COVID-19 is, is less than dying of chickenpox. The chance of somebody 20 to 30 dying of COVID-19 is the same as dying in a car accident each year. Um, and I think the argument should be that it, it, it should be prioritized, not just prioritized, but incentivized and even made mandatory for older people who are at risk of becoming ill and, and, and putting pressure on the NHS. So I, I think that um, the disproportionality of the ages that COVID-19 affects means it's very difficult to argue for a blanket mandatory policy. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, uh, I think you can probably do parallels with um, which diseases are made mandatory, uh, which um, diseases you know, vaccines for are made mandatory. And they are the ones that there are a high risk for. Um, and you can't see, yeah, I think it would be diff more difficult to make the argument across populations if, if the risk is much less for young people. Yeah, I mean, if it was like, so Spanish flu killed 50 to 100 million people, it affected all ages, smallpox affected all ages, um, Ebola, if it was as infectious as COVID-19, all of those would be candidates for mandatory vaccination. But I think the fact that um, COVID-19 is primarily a, a, a lethal in, in the over 65s makes it different to those diseases. Um, so let's go to another question. Sorry we can't take um, interventions from the people who have asked the questions. I didn't choose this format. Um, so, uh, Thanks both for Samantha. Can you please expand on why you would be in favour of mandatory vaccination in the exceptional cases you mentioned, e.g. Qantas? Would not many of the same objections you raise about mandates on a larger scale apply on smaller scales? Would not the same reasons that would justify mandating vaccination to board a plane, keeping others safe, apply when not on a plane? So that one's for you. <laughs> It's a, good, it's a good point. I think then you still have the choice to um, take another means of transport uh, and it's really left then to the, the provider to decide whether um, that's something that they want. They don't have to worry about um, public sentiment um, unless it would affect uh, their own balance sheet. So if they did see um, a lot of people not wanting to fly with them, then that would be an indication to change that policy. But I think it um, gives responsibility to individual companies and um, individual parts of society rather than um, going across the board. So um, 
So Martino Bardelli asks, if the vaccine was to be made mandatory, how does one choose which vaccine to use? Well, I think um, that the safest, most effective vaccine would be the first candidate. Um, the, the problem is that the mRNA vaccines are five times as expensive as the Oxid vaccine. Um, so there would be a, a justice argument that, you know, resources may save more lives overall if a cheaper vaccine was used and, and healthcare elsewhere was improved. But I think that the first point would be to look at the, the safety and effectiveness. But, but Sam, do you have a view on how to choose a, a vaccine? Yeah, I think well, safety and effectiveness would be up there, but um, the, also the ease of transport, being able to get it to people, and um, what arrangements you have in your healthcare system um, already to put those things into place. Um, so there's a question with five votes about the safety of COVID vaccines for people with autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, so I'm not, um, I, I'm not, you know, an expert on autoimmune diseases. Do you know the the answer to that, um, Sam? I wouldn't go into a, a lot of detail, but I know this is part of some of the trial pro protocols to, to test in. Uh, populations with um, diseases. I'm sorry, I, I don't think either of us are probably the best people to answer that question. Um, so please explain herd immunity, which has been a highly toxic topic here in the UK. Do you want to do that, Sam, or do you want me to do that? Um, do you want to start off with, because um, you used it as one of your examples? So herd immunity is the concept that once you get sufficient numbers a sufficient number of of people in, in, in vaccinated immune in the population the disease no longer spreads um and so that it, it's it's contained and and even people who aren't vaccinated um are still protected because the disease is essentially contained or even eliminated so for does i think somebody mentioned before such for something like measles you need 95 percent of the population to be immune in order for it to stop spreading for for covid it, it's lower um and and it, it's somewhere between 50 and 80 percent um, i actually on a paper that's under consideration that that shows that if you allowed under 50 and the under age, 50 age group to just mix normally and, and severely isolated the over 50s, um, you would get to herd immunity in, in six months with the same um, pressure on the NHS as, as we've had so far. Um, which and, and herd immunity is much lower than we, we thought was necessary. Um, but, but do you have anything to, to add to herd immunity? Yeah, I mean, for COVID-19, I think it's something we're gonna be learning about um, over time. These are, it's still quite a um, uncharted territory um, knowing exactly what the herd immunity will be. Uh, what I would also say is that it is very important for um, protecting those vulnerable groups that we mentioned and is normally a consideration for um, vaccine policy. So finding out what, what the herd immunity will be for COVID-19 will be quite important. Okay, so there's uh, one with four votes here. If your starting point is this vaccine is mandatory, oh, it's just moved, sorry. Um, Helen Bedford's question, where's it gone? Has she removed it? Oh, yeah, so here it is, sorry. Um, if, 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 if your starting point is this vaccine is mandatory, could, could this affect the important relationship between the health professional and the parent, patient, with the professional less willing to answer their questions and concerns. So it, it's important to, to, to look at the, the actual policies that um, ha have been mandatory around the world. So, um, you know, fines, for example, in Italy are not issued by doctors. The doctor is completely separate um, from the, the state institution that issues the penalty for not being vaccinated. Um, so the, the argument that it will interfere with the doctor-patient relationship, I think, only applies with certain kinds of mandatory vaccination. Um, so, you know, it, 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 if, if it were compulsory and the doctor had to administer, that would severely change the doctor-patient relationship. 
Um, but but if it's, for example, in Australia, the 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 child you know the work, child welfare agency simply withholds a child benefit um, if 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 vaccination hasn't been completed. So um, I think the doctor should still be willing to answer questions and concerns and have a normal doctor patient relationship. Um, shall I go on to the next one? Um, so at, so Ruta uh, Samonskite asks, as with other vaccines, is there a point in having it if half of the population won't do it? How effective would the vaccine be if let's say one person who was vaccinated was in a room with nine people who had COVID and were not vaccinated? Um, well, there will still be a benefit to having half the population vaccinated, particularly if it's the half that are most vulnerable. So the government's current plans are to, to administer to healthcare workers and, and people who are over the age of 80, then over the age of 70, and then over the age of 60. And so those people are most likely, the elderly are most likely to become severely ill and most likely to require hospitalisation and, and medical treatment. So even if you just were able to get uptake amongst the elderly and no people under the age of 50 took it, you would have a very significant effect um, and hopefully remove the need for lockdown. So partial effectiveness is still um, worth going for, especially if it's, if it's effective at protecting the vulnerable. And yes, you'd still be protected if you were vaccinated and you're in a room with nine people if, if the vaccine was effective. Um, so you, you don't need um, to, to have low numbers if the vaccine's been effective in you. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we're, we're also likely to have other public health measures continuing for quite a while. So that could also play a part in controlling and um, hopefully eliminating COVID-19. Uh, and yeah, what we have to think about is um, these these vaccines are going to be rolled out relatively slowly. We're not going to have um, all of the doses we need right away. Uh, there's a space between um, getting your first dose and your second dose and then a uh, period when you're immune. So yeah, we're, we're in this for a bit longer and I think um, having uh, half, half the population vaccinated with other measures might still have an impact. Okay, so uh, Levi asks, protecting yourself is fine in theory, but won't the virus be more likely to mutate if less people are vaccinated, making the vaccine uh, that we have possibly useless? Um, well, I, I, I'm inclined to think that's a possibility, but Sam, do you know anything specific on that? Um, so I would say this is something that the, the vaccine teams are working on, um, thinking about what, what happens if the virus mutates. And um, from what I've seen, um, the scientists have been saying that it's, it's something that they would be able to address, um, especially from the types of vaccine platforms that are being used at the moment, that they might be able to adapt a vaccine like we have with flu every year, a new vaccine. Okay, so Val Rossman asks with four votes, in almost every country enthusiasm for the vaccine has dropped. Surely this will affect uptake. Has any research been done to explain this change in attitude? Sam, that's for you. Yeah, so I wouldn't read too much into these polls. Uh, I do think, um, as, as we've seen some of the announcements being made, there will be work going into um, explaining more what's gone into the vaccine development and making um, clear arguments about um, uh, why vaccines have been approved uh, and explaining the benefits. So there's still going to be work going on. Uh, we might see that change again. I, I wouldn't. I would. It, it is a concern, but I wouldn't worry too much about small dips in um, or small changes in these polls. Okay. I'll. Um is one for me that <laughs> I'd like to. Professor Savalescu, would it be, uh, this is from Lena, would it be ethical, fair, moral to make someone above a certain age, someone who's paid their taxes, worn their seatbelts, had a possibly good life, overall healthy and is enjoying their ret retirement, be vaccinated with the new vaccine, come what it may, one that might have rather adverse effects and even bring a health decline because of still unknown side effects that might hit harder older people? 
Well, I, I, you know, I gave the argument for mandatory vaccination because I was asked to. I'm, I'm actually more of a libertarian and I think it should be your choice. Um, but the, the only, uh, only other consideration I would say is that because older people are more likely to go into respiratory failure and need hospitalisation and intensive care, which means that those resources aren't available for others, I think that, you know, there's a balance that they, they either, you know, need to be prepared to be a lower priority candidate for an intensive care bed or, or be willing to take the vaccine. Um, or, you know, we just, um, we just, you know, have a lottery. Um, but I think the argument um, is that, that, you know, it's because of this need to protect the NHS that's driven the various lockdowns. Um, now, again, I think that argument is, is weaker than is commonly um, made. And, you know, I, I think we, we could be prepared to accept that people just make their own decisions about, about vaccination and behaviour and, and we deal with it by triaging um, at the level of hospital admissions. Um, so let's see. So here's one for you, Sam. Measles is extremely contagious. This is Patrick McLean. And around 90% vaccine coverage is needed to prevent outbreaks. COVID is less infectious than measles and perhaps only 80 to 90% coverage will be required. This clearly changes the marginal benefit of convincing or coercing the unvaccinated few to take a COVID vaccine. Why would a government want to enrage a subset of the population to meet a target of universal coverage that may not even matter? Yeah, I think that says it really. If, if we have in these polls um, about 70% of people saying that they, they would take a vaccine in this country, um, do you really want to make a mandatory policy for that remaining 30%? And we don't actually we don't even know what will happen um, when it comes down to um, making that decision about vaccination. Uh, these these are only polls, but um, uh, they could still be convinced later on. I don't think it would be worth having a policy uh, for that remainder. So if if say the you know at the moment there's not enough vaccine, but let, let's say in six months' time that the production upscales, there's enough vaccine for everyone, um, but only you know, 40% of the population have, have chosen to have vaccination or 50%, would you then move to consider a mandatory policy? I, I would like to have um, mandatory policies uh, that would be in certain areas. So for travel, I think that would be um, a, a way of bringing up vaccination um, and stopping the virus being imported and, and moving around. I think that's... Um, that's a major issue. So uh, I, I just don't think um, something across the board like, like that would work. Okay. Um, here's uh, Colin asks, how successful and what reactions has there been to the compulsory vaccinations of children in Singapore? Sam, that, that would be one for you. Um, so I think this, this, is, this is very recent. So um, I wouldn't be able to say too much about this. I don't think there's been much research um, about Singapore, um, uh, fi finding out about what people are thinking on compulsory vaccination. As far as I know, it's only been talk something that's been talked about uh, more recently and not enacted. Um, okay, so, so John asks, do you believe that it takes approximately one year after a vaccine or other pharmaceutical becomes available to the public for the safety profile to be more complete? If so, should the issue of mandatory vaccination be limited to certain groups such as healthcare personnel, first responders, essential workers that will expose the public and some businesses? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I think that th there is always when a new vaccine is introduced, an ongoing monitoring for rare um, uh, and unforeseen side effects. Um, so it's typical for any um, trial to, to have, you know, a, a post surveillance for, for quite a period of time, which may be a year, maybe longer. Um, so safety is a value judgment. Um, you know, is it safe to drive at um, 70 miles an hour? 
well, the Germans drive at 200 or, well, you know, 150 miles an hour. The, the Australians drive at 60 miles an hour. It's a question of how much risk do you, do you accept? And, 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 and that there isn't a sort of formula to that. So that's, I think, the, the issue here is there isn't suddenly a line, that a bright line that you cross over and this is safe. It's always you're getting more confident that there are fewer fewer risks, um, but at some point you have to decide whether you jump in the water or you don't. Um, Sam, do you have something to say on that? Yeah, the the argument with um, vaccines is not that they're one hundred percent safe because nothing is one hundred percent safe. But um, we have to think about what, what the risks are of getting the disease and whether you think the benefit of vaccination outweighs those risks. So uh, Clara from the Oxford Martin School says, would setting up a scheme similar to the NUS card for a COVID vaccine passport where you get discounts in shops, travel to encourage vaccination rather than mandatory? Well, actually, I think in this case, given that it is a novel vaccine, I personally think incentivization and even payment is a better way to accelerate um, vaccine uptake than making it mandatory. Um, and indeed, you know, immunity passports are, are a version of this, enabling you to travel more freely or go to different venues, not, not wear a mask perhaps. So I think these sorts of incentive schemes are going to be better than, than punishments for something as, as controversial as, as, um, as, the, as the vaccine. Um, but nobody seems to be seriously considering incentivization or payment. Um, Sam, do you want to say anything on that? I just add on immunity passports. Um, it's slightly that we we will have some kind of way of um, uh, showing that we've been vaccinated, um, at least to to communicate to your um, GP. This is something that's been talked about that you you need to have some kind of documentation um to let other people know that you've been vaccinated and whether you want to attach that to um certain benefits will be will be a discussion that we're having um i suppose people people might be worried about um this idea um id cards didn't go very didn't go down very well in the uk um and i can see some people being against the idea of um having a status like whether you've been immunised or not on some official documentation. So uh, that's something that we're, we're yet to see how that will play out. Um, so uh, among the three Cs, Monica asks, how could the UK do better on confidence? Is transparency and presentation of data optimal to support that confidence? So I'm going to hand this over to you, Sam, but I, I just want to say I, I, I'm not that confident in, in the government. This is a government that told us that, that British beef was safe. This was a government that told us that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, this is a government that told us to buy diesel vehicles because they were good for the environment. So I, I, I'm, I sort of understand people's scepticism about government. So Sam, how do you think we can address that? I agree also. I, I don't think um, it should really be the government telling us to take these vaccines. I mean, they will tell us to take the vaccines, but um, we tend to trust our healthcare providers. We tend to trust scientists, maybe other people in society, community leaders. And um, those are the people that we need um, to be behind vaccination and um, also explaining um, the safety and efficacy of vaccines um, and not really government and politicians. Um. Okay, let me see. Uh, have you spotted any others that uh, have high? Uh... Hi, Julian. Just to let you know, this should be the last question for this evening. Okay. Um, so, uh, so here's a question for you, Sam. Are you going to get vaccinated as soon as it's available, Inga? Yep, <laughs> I think so. Well, I'm not going to, um, and I'll tell you why, and that is because I have antibodies because uh, I had COVID-19 and I haven't seen one. I actually looked up the CDC today and they said they can't provide any advice for people who have previously had COVID-19 on whether they should be vaccinated or not, and I think it's absolutely striking. 
there's been no discussion. And a lot of these NHS healthcare workers will have had COVID-19 that are supposed to be getting the vaccine. I don't know what the policy is for people. And there's somewhere between five and 20 million people in the UK who have had COVID-19. Um, so I think this is yet another example of failure to communicate and, and instill confidence. Um, so that, that would, that's, that's my answer. I'll, I'll wait and see what <laughs> the evidence shows for people who have actually had it. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Sam, um, and, and all the audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, and I'm sorry we, it hasn't been exactly like having a live event, but I appreciate all the very interesting questions and, and also um, the very reasonable discussion we've had. Um, so, and, and, and thank you for being a, a part of this debate. So, good night. Good night, everyone.